Well, good morning and welcome all of you to our uh, Resurrection Sunday worship service here on this wonderful morning as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our call to worship this morning is out of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Peter writes this in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many.
My name is Nathan Loudon, and I'm the pastor at Millwood Baptist Church. I just want to wish you a happy Easter and welcome you to our online service today. Certainly glad to have you. A couple things that I want to share with you. I'm coming to you from my office today. We have a, another church that's actually uh, recording with a few people downstairs for their online service as they don't have a, a church building. So happy to come up here and let them use that for just a moment uh, this morning. Uh, just to let you know, we do have building blocks that are starting our second quarter. Uh, some of them started this morning. Uh, we have some that will be starting this next week. So look for that in your email and look for that information uh, online. Uh, as you know, uh, we are uh, putting our service online uh, because until the end of this month during COVID-19, uh, we have a stay home, stay safe guideline. Uh, we potentially have plans from our governor coming out next week. Uh, that might give us a, a rollout or something like that on what to expect to get things back, quote-unquote, to normal. Uh, so we're going to pray for that. We hope for that. But until then, we're so thankful for this medium to be able to uh, share God's Word and even sing and pray together. I would ask you to turn with me in your Bibles for our pastoral reading to Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 5. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 5. And here's what we find in this passage, Romans 6, 3 through 5. Our hope in Christ's resurrection is that we will certainly enjoy his resurrection too. Our hope in Christ's resurrection is that we might certainly enjoy his resurrection too. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 5. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Let's take this hope that all those who are trusting and have faith in Christ will enjoy resurrection too. Let's pray for members in our church for encouragement, for perseverance, for our mission points in Acuna and the Middle East. Pray for our governing officials. Pray for our own hope for encouragement because of the resurrection. Confess any sin that we've had this week. Would you bow with me in your home and pray? Father, we thank you for this word, for this passage, uh, which gives us the personal hope that if we are trusting in Christ, if we are united with him, and we will enjoy his resurrection as well. And we pray and thanks that we have this glorious hope, this truth to bank our life upon, that even death is not a fear for us, not a fret for us, because of our hope in Christ raised from the dead. And we just confess for a moment that this last week we've thought about a lot of temporal things. We've let ourselves be taken away by other people's affections, other people's desires, other people's rudeness, injustices toward us. 
we have lust after things of this world rather than things of eternity and resurrection. So we're all over the place. And we just ask that uh, you would give us forgiveness in Christ. We throw ourselves on you asking and pleading that you would remove the stain of sin from us, the things that we have desired, the things that we have wanted, the things that we have longed for, the things that we have believed, lies that we have believed. Would you forgive us for those things and help us today fix our eyes back on the hope of the resurrection, back on the hope of life being in Christ raised from the dead, that there's no other source of life. Help us not to try to get our life out of things that are earthly and that are not eternal, that cannot conquer the grave. And God, would you help us today rejoice as we remember Christ's resurrection. Help us to be happy in you. Help us to rejoice. We pray for the churches that we support in Acuna, Mexico, the two churches that we continue to pray for and support in the Middle East. We pray, Father, knowing that they are experiencing challenges like we are. They are experiencing things that we aren't, even more things. We pray that you help them to continue to gather. We pray that you help them to continue to overcome every obstacle of faith. We pray that you help their ministries to bear fruit. Help them endure in this season, Father. We pray for our governing officials. Uh, We know that there are difficult decisions to be made by those who are over us in our city, state, and our federal level. We ask that you would give them wisdom, that there would be unity in our nation, that there would be clarity, that there would be courage to do the right but difficult and unpopular things. Would you help us, Father, to be gracious with those who are over us in this city, in our state, in our country. Help us to be compassionate towards others. Father, help us not to be anxious with our governing officials' decisions. Help us to be be kind about our governing officials' decisions because our hope and trust is not in their decision or their protection, but in resurrection, but in you. So anything anyone takes from us, Father, we are not lost. We are not want for hope and for peace. Thank you for this word. Thank you for this wonderful hope that if we have faith and trust in Christ and we are united in a death like his, we will certainly be united in a resurrection like his. Thank you for this. Help us rejoice in this today as we sing it, as we pray it, as we hear it preached. We love you, God. We pray this together in Christ's name. Amen.
Well, if you turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, that will be our sermon text for this morning. John 10, 17 and 18. Jesus says this in John chapter 10. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. The Gospel of Christ's Life Laid Down Michael Reeves, professor at Wales Evangelical School of Theology, has written a little book called Rejoicing in Christ, which I would commend to you. He begins in this way, Jesus Christ, God's perfect Son, we were made to find our satisfaction in Him. Quite simply, this book will be about enjoying Him, reveling in His all-sufficiency for us, and considering all that He is. Once upon a time, a little book like this would have been utterly run-of-the-mill, among the old Puritans, for example, you can scarcely find a writer who did not write or a preacher who did not preach something called the unsearchable riches of Christ. Christ set forth the glory of Christ or the like. Yet today, what sells? What puts the smile on the bookseller's face? The book that is about the reader. People want to read about themselves. There's nothing necessarily wrong in that, of course, but that is not primarily what life is about. We will find nothing so desirable, so delightful as Jesus. It's not just our self-focus, though. Reeves continues, and we naturally gravitate, it seems, toward anything but Jesus. And Christians, almost as much as anyone, whether it is the Christian worldview or quote-unquote, grace, the Bible, or the, quote, gospel, as if they were things in and of themselves that could save us. Even the cross can get abstracted from Jesus, as if the wood had some power of its own. Other things, wonderful things, vital concepts, beautiful discoveries, so easily edge Jesus aside. Easter, of all things, oddly enough, has its own way of edging out Jesus. Easter has become, for our culture, about eggs, about candy, about rabbits, about new outfits, and even the exchange of gifts. COVID-19 has led to the cancellation of the trappings of Easter, which have nothing to do with Christ Jesus. Perhaps this is actually a great gift to us. Be sure that we are not want for mechanisms, nor toys, or events to satisfy our hearts. We only need Christ. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, I do not care what church you belong to or what creed you are ready to die for. You do not know the truth of God unless the person of Christ is dear to you. For Christ is the precious cornerstone. Today's sermon is not meant merely to inform or to teach. In fact, you may have more questions when the message is over today than when we began. Today's sermon is to lead us to rejoice in Christ by gazing upon Him. To leave today holding Jesus Christ as dear to us. Perhaps you're not a Christian or perhaps you're watching today and you are a troubled Christian. Here today we want to discuss what is it that's so captivating about Christ? What is it about the religion of Christianity and about Jesus that makes him good? To that end, we will look at just one truth about Christ, which Michael read for us just a moment ago in John chapter 10, verse 18. No one, Jesus said takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Would you pray with me now? 
and ask for God to bless the preaching of his word. Father, we give you thanks and praise for your kindness in the gospel of Christ, in himself. We need to be encouraged in many things. We need to repent of many things. Would you use your word to encourage us where we should continue forward and help us to repent what we need to turn from? May this word, may your word help us rejoice in Christ today to hold him dear. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. John ten eighteen. Jesus says, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. And this is the single narrow truth that we will dwell upon today, that no one takes Jesus' life from him, but he lays it down. How did Jesus do that? What does it mean? I want us to first think for a moment as an in, by way of illustration, that Jesus dying is not like watching a train wreck. Maybe you've had that experience, hopefully not, or you've described a situation that way. It was like watching a train wreck. Well, what does that mean? When we, when we say that, we know that trains are typically not that fast moving, but that they are huge and they are unstoppable. To, to say it was like watching a train wreck means that you, you were forced to watch a huge, unstoppable collision that was beyond your power to stop. You were totally helpless to stop it. And friends, that is not what Jesus' death and crucifixion was like, most especially for Christ. Jesus was not caught up in some kind of cosmic fate which he couldn't help but fall into. Listen to this. The glory of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection is not merely that something happened to him for us. His own crucifixion was him doing something for us sinners. The first off-ramp for Jesus that he could take to avoid the cross that we'll look at this moment this morning is in John chapter 6 verse 15 where Jesus avoided becoming king. Now you might say, I thought Jesus was the king or didn't they write king of Jews over Jesus's head when he died? Yes, but Jesus could have assumed the throne in a different way without the cross. Remember, when the sign, the, the king of Jews, was placed over Jesus' head, the Pharisees came to Pilate and asked him to change the sign. They didn't like the sign saying king of Jews and everyone thinking that their king was on the cross. So they asked Pilate to, to put a new sign, to change the sign that said, This man said he was the king of the Jews. The Pilate had already written what he had written. So instead of dying the death of a king, with all the pomp and the circumstance, he died next to common thieves on a cross. The leaders of Israel rejected Jesus as king. But there was a moment in Jesus' life where he had a particular opportunity to take the throne and to become the king of his people Israel before the cross. During Jesus' life, his people, the Jews, were under Roman oppression. When Jesus was born, Jerusalem had been conquered by Rome for 63 years. People were anxious. They were tired of being trapped and ruled by a foreign polity. Years later, those tensions would eventually turn into war and hundreds of thousands, probably more than a million Jews, would be massacred between the years 66 A.D. and 135 A.D. in what came to be known as the Jewish-Roman Wars. The Jews longed for something like they had in the past, like when they had a king, like David. Before David, God's people, which would have been hundreds of years before Christ, before David, God's people had enjoyed oversight by judges, but they had no military might. But their first king, Saul, was an utter failure. But when David became king, when David became king, everything changed. 
all of the sudden, Israel's enemies didn't stand a chance anymore. David's mighty men, time and time again, won victory after victory, even when their military's might was absurdly disproportionately smaller than their enemies. You can see record of this in 2 Samuel chapter 23. And what exactly did David's victories secure for them? Their land. By routing their enemies, David secured the promised land for God's people. With the land came food and prosperity and houses and security. And friends, Jesus could have been that kind of king. Jesus could have taken David's throne as the rightful heir from David. That's the first thing that Matthew says about Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. The very first sentence, the very first sentence in the New Testament is this, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. To be the king is exactly what the people wanted from Jesus. Jesus wouldn't even have had to show his birth certificate or his tax records. Early in the book of John, they wanted Jesus to be king. John 6 tells us about the moment they wanted to make Jesus king right then. In particular, it was the moment that Jesus miraculously fed 5,000 people <clears throat> with a few loaves of bread and some fish. In that moment, with their stomachs filled, being split up into groups of hundreds and fifties, like with Moses under his leadership in Exodus 18, there with their stomachs filled with Jesus' bread, the murmur began to work its way through the crowd, let's make Jesus our king. It's implied here that the idea had begun to kind of float around this crowd like it did back in 1 Samuel 8. Now, who knows how this idea might have started? Maybe someone was getting their bread and they just said, Hey, this guy would this guy would make a great king. And slowly the word spread, Hey, let's let's make the bread maker our king. Doesn't that sound good? I'm I'm tired of having a Roman governor. We're God's people. This guy fits the bill. Let's make him king. Maybe we can even make a run on Rome. Apparently all through the crowd, along with the taste of bread, there was the taste of having their own king. And they had an heir of David right before them. But listen to what happened at the end of this moment. In John chapter 6, verse 14 through 15. When the people saw what he, Jesus, had done, the feeding of the 5,000, they said, this indeed is the prophet who is to come into the world, a reference to being the successor to Moses from Deuteronomy 8.15. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Why? Why not be king, Jesus? Because Jesus had something better to offer us than food for our stomachs. Listen, my wife can make some bread that will want to make you trade your shoes. Bread is essential to life. Maybe a few weeks ago you had a similar experience of many Americans where you saw empty shelves where there is usually bread. And you get just a taste, just a, just a little hint of what it's like to go without the most basic necessity. And oh, how great it would have been to have a king who makes bread and provides for us and does miracles and casts out demons and heals the sick. But Jesus would not be king like that. He would not be king for that. Jesus says, you would want me to be king for the sake of your stomachs. And Jesus has come to the cross for the sake of their souls. Friends, it may seem to you that Jesus has nothing to offer you. 
Nothing to give you. Nothing tangible to put in your hands. But when Jesus died for us, what was happening? Jesus was laying down his life for sinners like me and you. Jesus could have been king and avoided the cross altogether. Jesus also could have simply said no. Jesus could have just said no. Jesus said he had been given by the charge by his father in John 10, 18. He could have said no. In Matthew chapter 26, we have the record of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And three times he prays this prayer, which we see in Matthew 26, verse 39. And going on a little farther, he, Jesus, fell on his face, prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus prayed three times in the Garden of, of Gethsemane the night before he died. Three times he asked if there was another way to accomplish God's will besides the cross. One of my kids reflected in family devotion this week saying, well, since Jesus is obeying God and God is Jesus, then it is like Jesus is telling himself, yes. That was a wonderful perception. The idea of the Trinity, of the divinity of Christ is certainly a baffling mystery. How can Jesus be God of God and fully man is a sincere mystery. But in order for there to be a mystery... There must be a sincere fullness of both man and God in one man. Kevin DeYoung, speaking to the incarnation of Christ, says this, Jesus is truly God and truly man. He is not humanized deity, and he is not deified humanity. There was no conversion when Jesus became man. Rather, the divine nature assumed humanity. When the Son of God assumed a human nature, both Natures preserved their peculiar properties in one person. Listen, if Jesus is kind of 50-50, half God and half man, that's not mysterious. That's easy math. But for Christ to be fully God and fully man, that is mysterious. This begs a question for us. Did Jesus really have a choice? Could he have not laid down his life? Jesus says, I lay down my life. This is what makes him the good shepherd in this passage. But I'm not like those hired hands that, that, that just run off and, and leave the sheep to the wolves. I'm the good shepherd who lays down his life. No one takes it from me. I lay it down. Well, did Jesus really have a, a choice? If, if you are God and you do no wrong, then, then you couldn't sin. There's, there's no real choice to not lay down your life. And how do we make sense of Jesus' choice on his own will to lay down his life in obedience to his Father's charge if he was, in fact, God himself? Where's the romance? Where's the love in laying down your life if you don't have a choice? It isn't beautiful for robots to die for people. Could Jesus have said no? Here is my answer. Yes. Jesus could have said no because he was fully man like Adam. He had capacity to choose morally. He had the capacity to choose as much as you or I. As fully as Christ was a man, he could have fully said no to the cross. But the answer is also no. Just like all mankind has the capacity to make moral choices, but are corrupt by sin's nature so we sin, so the Son of God assumed the capacity to sin, the capacity for choice, but instead was found to have true and fully divine nature. This great mystery is how we get an anguishing Son of God in the garden. What was happening in the garden where Jesus prayed three times about the Father's will? The divine will in Christ was living 
obedience in the flesh of mankind against the temptation to tell God no, to go a different way than the cross. But as Spurgeon said, Jesus entered all that men did except their sins. It is interesting that when Jesus was offered the throne, he simply went the other way. When he was threatened, as we'll see in a moment, to be killed in different ways, he slipped away from their grasp. But here in the garden, alone with God in prayer, Luke records it like this in Luke chapter 23, verse 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. What was Jesus doing? He was laying down his life of his own accord. In the garden, there in the garden, in prayer for sinners such as you and I, Jesus made up his mind. He was exercising his will to say yes to the Father's plan to drink the cup of sin and of God's wrath for sinners like me and you. Jesus could have become king. He could have said no. And he also could have simply escaped. And Jesus escaped death on more than one occasion. And do not think that Jesus was just going around from town to town in his life, making everyone happy until he died. People wanted Jesus dead long before the cross. But Jesus makes quick escapes in Luke 4 and in John 8, for example. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus is in the synagogue in Nazareth. He was given a scroll to read. Jesus read Isaiah, which prophesied, He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captive, sight to the blind, liberty to the oppressed. Then, in the synagogue in Nazareth, after reading Isaiah, Jesus rolled up the scroll and said to everyone in there in who was listening, Today, this scripture is fulfilled to all who hear it. After that, he went on to explain exactly what he meant and why he said this scripture was fulfilled in him. But look what happened after Jesus gave this explanation in Luke 4, 28 through 30. When they heard these things, all the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him off the cliff. But verse 30, Luke 4, 30, but passing through their midst, he went on away. Jesus was this close to being tossed off a cliff. But Luke says Jesus just passed through their midst. What exactly this is describing, I, I don't even know. And that is what happened to, in John as well. Jesus is in the temple once again making claims about himself. John records what happened in John chapter 8 verses 58 to 59. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. This is a claim to divinity, to eternality. Before Abraham was, I am. And that phrase, I am, would have sent them reeling. That's what God says about himself. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But listen to what happens at the end. John chapter 8, verse 59. They picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Jesus hid himself. Friends, Jesus is apparently a ninja. I, I don't even know what these passages mean actually happened. How it describes, what kinds of events it's describing. It doesn't really give us the details about how Jesus actually removed himself from these situations in a way that makes sense. He, he passed through their midst. Jesus just hid himself. I mean, how do you go from, they're about to stone you. You just claim to be God. They picked up rocks. And, and then you just won the game of hide and seek? What is this saying happened? When the, when the chief priest 
Listen to where we're going here. When, when the chief priests and the guards come to take Jesus to be crucified in the Garden of Gethsemane, he has already avoided being thrown off a cliff. He's already avoided being pummeled with rocks. This is not a new scenario for Jesus. Jesus before has passed through their midst, or, or he hid himself and went away. But on this night, before he was crucified, this is what happened. Matthew chapter 26, verse 47 through 50. Matthew chapter 46, verses 47 through 50. While he was still speaking, <clears throat> coming out of prayer, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd <clears throat> with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And when he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. He kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. And then they came up and they laid hands on Jesus and seized him. Can you imagine Peter and the disciples' confusion? Their whole world is no longer making any sense this moment. Jesus tells the demons where to go. We, we escaped the cliff, we, we hid from the stoning, but then to watch these men put their hands on Jesus and for Jesus to do nothing. What was going on? Friends, remember that this is the glory of the Good Shepherd. Reason to rejoice in Christ today. No one takes his life from him. He lays it down on his own accord. And Jesus did not get captured. Jesus did not just happen to find himself in, in, in an escape room that he couldn't get out of. Instead, he walked right into the capture, which would lead to his crucifixion for sinners like me and like you. In fact, when we get to the moment where Jesus is apprehended, we just begin to see that Jesus seems to show just how determined he is to get to the cross. He could have become king, could have said no, could have simply escaped, and he could have used his power. He could have used his power in the garden, when they laid their hands on Christ to seize him, Peter began to think, like, like any faithful disciple would think, get your hands off him. And so what does Peter do? He immediately drew out his sword and he starts swinging. And probably, we see here, Peter hadn't swung the sword too many times. Swings like a fisherman. He misses and cuts off a soldier's ear. This is how Jesus responds in that moment in Matthew chapter 26, verse 52 to 54. They've put their hands on Christ to seize him. Peter comes out with the attack. Matthew 26, verse 52. Then Jesus said to him, to Peter, put your sword back in its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you not think that I can appeal to my father and he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled? That it must be so. Jesus basically said, A cute sword, Peter. Let's, let's put that away. Jesus was not lacking in might or power or, or a military to free him from this seizure. Just as a reference for us, Isaiah and 2 Kings reference this one angel of the Lord in the Old Testament who killed at one time in one night 185,000 Assyrians, warriors, 
All it would take throughout the Bible is for one angel to appear. And over and over and over in the Bible, when people see one angel, they fall on their faces, terrified. And Jesus tells Peter, put your sword up. I could ask the Father and he would send me 12,000 angels. And here you are, cutting off ears with your pocket knife. This is what makes Jesus going to the cross so awfully wonderful. It's all the power to conquer and destroy and rule everything, but instead, he's laying down his life for sinners like me and you. Jesus could have become king. Jesus could have said no. Jesus could have simply escaped. Jesus had all the power in the world. We haven't even talked about the time when Jesus turned down Satan's offer. Matthew chapter 4, to rule all the, and possess all the kingdoms in the world. We haven't even begun to entertain the, the idea that Jesus could have defended himself before Pilate and maybe got out of all of this in one of his trials. But no matter where we look, the glory of Christ is the same. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down on my own accord. The glory of Christ's crucifixion is not merely that something happened to Jesus for us. His own crucifixion was Him doing something on behalf of sinners. Why a cross? Why the cross? Why not the cliff? Why not the stoning? Why not something else? Wouldn't just a, a random death do? Well, there are a number of reasons, but here's a primary reason explained in short in Galatians chapter 3 in verse 10 through 13. Why a cross? Why the wood? Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. Paul, teaching about the salvation that is in Christ Jesus, says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, quoting Deuteronomy 27, It is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Well, friends, that is clearly all of us. Just like Jesus, or excuse me, just like Moses was instructing the people before they went into the promised land, God's people, he told, he told them, if you cannot keep the law, and everyone who relies on the works of the law, you are under a curse, because cursed is everyone who does not by, abide by all the things written in the book of the law, and do them. None of us can say that we have perfectly handled COVID-19, or our children, or our own hearts, or our own neighbors, today. We all have sin in our hearts and in our heads and in our hands. We're cursed. We are unable to abide by the things written in the book of the law and do them. We cannot do them, which means we are cursed before God. But here's the hope in verse 13, Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Read it again. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law that we couldn't keep by becoming a curse for us. For it is also written in Deuteronomy here in chapter 21. It's also written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. What is Paul's point here? By dying... And hanging on a tree, Jesus was entering into the curse of our not being able to keep the law. Paul went so far to say that Jesus redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse for us. He became our curse and endured the crucifixion which our curse and our sin deserve. Why not the cliff? No curse there. 
Why not the stones? No curse there. Cursed is everyone who is hanged on the tree. Friends, Jesus laid his life down specifically on a tree to show and in order to become the curse for us that we who cannot keep the law and are cursed deserve the tree. To die on a tree of all things for the co-creator to die on a tree. Oh, friends, I think that there is at least a, a wink and a nod that points to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden and all of this. The tree which man has been cut off from since the fall. And here on the cross is one of whom John began by saying, In him, in Jesus, was, was life. He was life. In him, in Jesus, was life. And, and this life was the light of men, John chapter 1. And here on the cross, on the tree, is the source of life, cursed, hanged, and killed. This is what makes Jesus' resurrection so incredible. It is what Jesus was raised out of that gives us hope. How can Jesus die and redeem us from the curse? How can Jesus become the curse and redeem us from the curse? John chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus says, No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Just as Jesus has become the curse for us, Hanged on a tree, Jesus has gone through the curse and through death and raised from the grave for sinners like me and you. 1 Corinthians 15, 21-22 says, For as by a man came death, as we received death, by, and by a man has... By a man also has come the resurrection of dead, speaking of Christ. For as in Adam all die, we all get our sin and our curse from Adam, handed down through the progeny to us. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Our COVID-19 memory verse is Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because his trust is in you. This day, this message is about one thing, fixing our mind and our faith on Jesus Christ, who became the curse for us, who was crucified for us, who had the power, who could have escaped, who could have said no, who could have become king, instead laid down his life and became a curse on the tree for us. And so we sing today, so that we will be at perfect peace. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. Have you... Considered Christ as your Savior today. That he laid down his life for you. So that he might also raise up your life in his resurrection. Let me encourage you today to believe. To rejoice in Christ. No one takes his life from him. He laid it down for us on its own accord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today, for your grace in all things, but most especially in Christ crucified for us. We recognize and we confess that he is glorious, and beautiful, and wonderful because he laid down his life for us. We give you thanks and we give you praise for this charge and this authority to him and for his love to see it through for us. 
Thank you, Father, for this day and the opportunity to remember and to dwell and to enjoy these things. Help us to live in faith and in peace with you. Trusting Christ has been crucified for us. Become the curse, raised from the dead, to redeem us from sin. We love you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're certainly glad that you have tuned in today, and uh, we would love to care for you any way that we can. We'd love to hear from you uh, in Facebook. You can direct message us. My email is nathan at millwoodbaptist.com. We would love to hear from you personally. If there's a way that our church can connect you or answer any questions about today or pray with you about anything. If you'd like to know more about following Christ, we urge you and encourage you to anyone who might have sent you the link for this message or the service today, reach out to them and let them know you'd like to just have a conversation. Ask them some more questions. Uh, we want to be here for you any way that we can. Hope you have a wonderful Easter Sunday, that you are able to rest, that you are able to enjoy Christ this day. Love you. Have a wonderful day. Oh, praise his name.